And I think um, for some assistance with that DLA claim for uh, a nighttime award for care and attention for recurring nightmares <laughs> about the future of Social Security and just how much um, you need um, in the evening in order to uh, cope with that. Um, I'm in my um, <clears throat> allotted role as a cheerless leader, um, but I shall try and be uh, positive. And I want to do three things this morning fairly uh, quickly and briefly. Um, the first um, is to say something about the role of uh, human rights arguments are playing in the field of social security, um, where I think there is a gentle but quite important expansive um, uh, trend. Secondly, to comment um, favorably on the work of Eileen, uh, but make one or two um, observations. And that leads me neatly into the third point, which is to say something on the current state of play on Social Security, particularly around uh, universal credit. Um, as many of you in this audience know, the Human Rights Act now has led to many challenges to Social Security. Um, it's nothing new, but welfare reform has seen a slew of them in Britain. Um, some successful and some unsuccessful. It's fair to say that the outcomes to date have been mixed, but many of those challenges are ongoing and therefore there is a kind of watch this space. Um, and it'll be important for Northern Ireland, when we eventually get our legislation, to have a look at where uh, we might use uh, Human Rights Act, and assuming it uh, remains uh, with us, and one of my commission's um, abiding interests is what happens to the proposals around a, a, a Human Rights Act and a British Bill of Rights, particularly given where the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which is an international treaty which entrenches uh, the Human Rights Act and is a, a, a treaty of the two governments. So therefore, there are some very specific Northern Ireland issues at play in terms of the, of the Human Rights Act and what happens there. Um, my first point is to kind of, and, and this is an audience that largely knows this, but to remind everybody that many of the Social Security cuts are here already, they're separate from what's, when, what's in the welfare reform legislation. So the freezing of benefits, um, the operating through the CPI rather than IPI, many of the, uh, the tax credit changes, some of the housing benefit changes, um, and the particularly unfriendly changes to migrants around, uh, uh, EU migrants around social security, all of that are with us already. So we've taken a very considerable hit before you even start to look at um, welfare reform. Nonetheless, many of the changes which have been um, passed through the GB 2012 Welfare Reform Act and our legislation have not happened yet. So the introduction of universal credit and PIP and the ESSA changes for people in the work-related activity group and many others are about to be visited um, on us. And in the meantime, we still have nonetheless paid for that in terms of, and Eileen mentioned it, significant financial penalties and the lost opportunity to spend that money um, progressively um, elsewhere in terms of uh, health or social care or, or, or other uh, important public expenditure areas. Um, <clears throat> so um, I want to highlight in terms of the Human Rights Act, one of the, the interesting things I think that is beginning to emerge in, in some of the um, challenges, and that is the use of international human rights treaties beyond the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and traditionally, the European Convention is the only treaty which is incorporated within uh, uh, our domestic legislation. Uh, but nonetheless, um, and in a number of cases, increasingly we've looked to other treaties. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, for example, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities being just two examples. And effectively, and simplifying slightly, but not, not unduly so, Traditionally, there have been three circumstances where you might look at international treaties. First is where the meaning of the legislation is in doubt. Second is to guide development of the common law. And third is actually when interpreting the European Convention through the Human Rights Act, uh, where similar issues have arisen and the courts have used international law in, in a similar field in terms of aiding their own interpretation. And that third principle, for example, was applied to the benefit cap case um, last year when analysing whether Article 3 in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, in other words, where in all actions concerning children the best interests of the child should be um, considered, 
was included in a discussion of the judgment. And very interestingly, when the case originally went, the UNCRC didn't feature, mm -hmm. and it was as the case unfolded that it became clear that there was a potential issue to look at. Again, time doesn't really do justice to this. Two judges found that the benefit cap um, was uh, incompatible with a uh, right to family life. One of those who, who held that, um, uh, Brian Kerr from this, hails from this parish, actually um, said that he felt that uh, the convention is now incorporated into um, uh, UK law, something that was a bridge too far for um, the other Supreme Court judges. Two found against, and the third who um, are eventually came down with, on the side of, of the two uh, that felt that the benefit cap was lawful, held that on a slightly strange basis that because this was discriminatory in terms of uh, women in particular and lone parents and had a disproportionate effect on women as the um, carers of children, uh, it wasn't a children's issue and therefore the discrimination um, didn't make it uh, incompatible with, um, with the convention. Now, I'm actually not sure whether that's going to the Strasbourg or not, that case. But that was at a time when the benefit cap was £23,000. It's gone down to 20000 That case was so close to getting over the line that I think the benefit cap will ultimately um, see its nadir, I suspect, in a court of law uh, eventually. So legal challenges are still important. Um, the Un United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Rights of uh, people with disabilities was also mentioned in the recent Matheson case. That's the withdrawal of uh, DLA for children uh, automatically after they've spent 84 <laughs> days in hospital. It wasn't central to the ultimate outcome, which was successful, that held that this automatic withdrawal of, of benefit after 84 days was, again, contrary to Article 14, freedom from discrimination, when read with Article 8 in the uh, family life. So. Human rights and the convention are important for um, social security and we need to have a look at the potential challenges there will be with our new legislation once it comes through. The second issue is for, for me then very quickly is the Welfare uh, Reform Mitigations Working Project, which I think is a really important and a very valuable report. I know that in Northern Ireland we have a tendency to, to be curmudgeonly um, about almost anything and everything. Um, and when you actually look at the constraints under which that committee, Eileen and her colleagues were working, the time constraints, there was um, a budget and it had to be met within that. You have to do the kind of number crunching work that needs to be done. Um, there wasn't a lot of work to build on elsewhere. Scotland had been doing some, some interesting things, but this was not a report where you could draw down off the shelf and say, here are the international examples, or even, the, frankly, the domestic examples, and just land them. Um, what I like about the report um, are a number of things. Um, first of all, it's extremely practical. Um, it means we will go further in terms of mitigations than anywhere else in the UK, including in Scotland, where um, there are some very progressive and, and um, I think, sensible things that are being done. Secondly, it recognises that this isn't just about the social security system. So the work uh, on advice services and importantly signposting, I particularly like the fact that the work on advice services talks about not just local advice, but regional advice. I can say this now without any vested self-interest at all, but the social security agency operates with local offices and a decision-making service, a central uh, hub of expertise the housing executive operates in exactly the same way with district offices and regional expertise. So why on earth you don't reckon, and they are considered as part of frontline together, so why on earth you wouldn't do the same for um, uh, services in terms of advice uh, is, is uh, beyond me. But um, Northern Ireland people are curmudgeonly, and I wouldn't like to uh, ruin our um, well-earned, uh, hard-earned and long um, reputation. There are a couple of things that I would say. Um, the first, and everyone can have a wish list and I ac and accept this, I think where I was disappointed were on, uh, was no mitigation, for example, around maternity support. Um, since 2010, the payment during pregnancy under labour, I've forgotten the name of it now, but Alison will remember it, went, uh, uh, thank you, health and pregnancy <laughs> payment uh, went in, um, we then 
reduced the amount that you get by way of a statutory maternity payment. We then restricted when you can get a, 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 a maternity uh, payment, a one-off single, uh, single payment. I'm really showing my age. <coughs> um, and then the additional support for a child under one in tax credits went as well. Now, if you want to give a child the best start in life, there are a whole plethora of ways you can do it, but one of which is to offer some income for both um, the uh, mother and the child at the very early stage of life. I think we could have found something there. The cost would have been con self-contained and, and could have been done, um, and I think that would have been important. Sure, but it's, it's, it's one of the areas that whether by way of through d discretion to support elsewhere, I think, I think there was something that could have been done there. The other area was sanctions. I think what's in there in sanctions is very good. Um, my reading of the document, I wasn't clear where the kind of helpline and advice will be. I think it's very important that it's located somewhere centrally outside of, um, uh, of government and it, it may well be that that's the intention. There are two things about sanctions. One is to remember what the government has done by way of regulation. So the issue of sanctions burgeoning has a number of causes, but there are a number of things that we could do in terms of when our regulations come through. You used to have 10 working days in which to explain why you had missed an appointment or a variety of other reasons uh, that you are now facing sanctions. Regulations cut that down to five working days. Well, there's no reason, and it's by, it's, it came out in, in um, the Select Committee's report. There's no reason why we have to go to five working days. I don't think the Treasury will be hammering on our door looking for financial penalties if we decided to do that. Sanctions of mental health, and mental health was, was quite rightly um, raised elsewhere in the report. Um, there were recent parliamentary figures that showed that two-thirds of the sanctions for ESA are for people with mental health difficulties. That's where the ESA sanctions lie, it's the mental health end. And I remember from my SAC days, and, and some of this research now is, is, um, is 10 years old and we've moved on a bit, but that 20% of those who are sanctioned actually don't realize they're sanctioned until after the event. And that again is to do with mental, people with mental health problems, people with learning disab disabilities, people with, um, whose English is not a first language. So mental, we need to concentrate there uh, on that mental health di dimension and sanctions in particular. And I hope when the advice line and that kind of service kicks in, um, we can look at that. Um, so in terms then of um, mitigations, I think we've done a very good, and uh, Eileen and her committee have done a very good job. Um, I think the highlighting of food poverty was really important. I remember from my days, I still sit on the Community Foundation for Northern Ireland, one of the issues we faced was lots of applications coming in to say, can we have some money to stock up a food bank? And we had quite a long debate about, is that a good thing to give money for as a community foundation? In the end, we came up with what I think is probably the the right decision that no, we wouldn't give money for food to food bank organizations, but yes, we would give money to organizations that wanted to tie what they were doing in terms of um, relieving poverty to research or other activities that actually looked at and monitored what the underlying causes were for people coming to food banks in the first place so that we could make a contribution <coughs> without it simply being um, a recognition that somehow you have to deal with what the state is doing by way of these kinds of kinds of activities. Finally, and this leads me to my to my final point, um, uh, the mitigations will help um, those people who are already in the system, and in some cases it may help those going forward. But it could never, and it was never intended, and there's no way it could do it, future-proof the system. One of the sterile debates we had was somehow that nobody would ever be worse off ever, and that was never possible. We could never future-proof kind of social security changes. Um, so, where are we kind of now? Um, and what kind of, worries, kind of worries me, but potentially gives me some hope, is that the Chancellor's response to the tax credit cuts was to deploy a slate of hand, effectively remove the tax credit cuts, but keep them in universal credit. And that's had the political virtue of kind of introducing the cuts in Britain on an incremental basis for those who are moving from tax credits to universal credit. Some will get some tr transitional protection, not everybody will, and all those new universal credit claimants who are coming into the system for the first time 
after many of those changes will not get uh, protection at all. Now, the political hope is that by salami slicing the numbers of people who are affected by this instead of one great big bang, that people won't be quite so um, upset and angry about what's happening. I'm not convinced that that's the case. Um, and therefore, I still think there may well be um, a political backlash. But I remember um, a SAC seminar many, many years ago. I think Alison might have been there with me, which was about looking at the time about introducing integrated tax and benefits systems, etc. And a debate around what happens if you have a brilliant policy idea. Um, is it actually best to, you know, is that a good thing to kind of really have those debates um, or not? And the rather depressing conclusion to this particular seminar was that by the time, uh, no matter how brilliant an idea you have in, in policy terms for Social Security, mm -hmm. by the time the Treasury has got hold of it, mm -hmm. you have the political exigencies of whatever party is in power, you have the foibles of a minister, you have any sort of IT system that it almost certainly will come out looking nothing like the way it went in. And I thought at the time that that's a ter kind of terrible, depressing thought that we can never really have lots of progressive change in those kind of circumstances. And lo and behold, what have we got with universal credit? Well, exactly the model that, um, that people were talking about all those years ago. The, I think universal credit does have the kernel of a good idea in terms of what the Center for Social Justice was saying. The two principles were to simplify the system and to ensure that you make work pay. And we were in an era then when that was looking at 55 pence and the pound was the maximum that people would lose by moving from out of work in, into work. It was going to cost four billion. Um, but the better work incentives, the encouragement to get into work, the more greater flexibility, particularly for lone parents doing less than 16 hours, etc., etc., the scheme would eventually pay for itself. Well, we've now spent four billion actually slightly more than four billion on universal credit, but this money's been spent on patching up all kinds of problems that have arisen uh, in, in a number of different ways, including its implementation. But that four billion has been at the expense of the 33 billion that Alison mentioned earlier, cuts elsewhere in the system. That's the deal that had to be done with the Treasury. We're now saddled with a gargantuanly complex scheme. The only simplification is potentially you'll have one instead of six benefits. But trying to understand and navigate your way through universal credit will be as difficult as navigating your way through any of the existing benefits that we, that we currently have. And the incentive to make work pay has been shot to pieces. Um, there are some people for whom it, there will still be work incentives, but there are vast numbers of people for whom it won't. And working out individually as a claimant whether actually you're going to be better off in work than out is almost an impossible task, as impossible as kind of better off calculations are in the, the current system. Um, the IFS and <clears throat> I recently saw a piece of work where they have they've looked at uh, child poverty for children with more uh, for families with more than two children. There is going to be a particular and very sharp increase in child poverty for that group, and it's almost entirely attributed to uh, restricting. Uh, assistance through universal credit to having two children only and anything beyond that no longer provides <coughs> provides support through universal credit. So we are going to, particularly with large families, and there's one thing we know about Northern Ireland, we tend to have larger families. So all of this is going to, to, to hit us rather badly. I thought DSD were very good that with the system before, or the, uh, the arrangements before um, the chancellor's changes, they'd set out actually how much it was going to take out uh, of claimants' pockets. It was 1.1 <coughs> billion out of a, a total saving of 13.5 billion. In other words, much higher, a much greater proportion of savings than the numbers of people in Northern Ireland to the rest of the population. Well, we actually need to do that now with the kind of universal credit to get a sense of just how much is, is going. <coughs> so finally, where are we going with Social Security? We're saddled at the moment with universal credit, but it I'm not convinced that we won't find that those who think universal credit is the answer to everything won't slowly but surely find it undermined, including politicians who I don't think realize just what's around the, around the corner. Um, and we need to find a way to get back to those original principles of making work pay and uh, an administratively simple um, scheme. 
and I hope that debate starts here today. Thank you. Thank you.